Throughout the West, capitalism is dramatic decline. What we're seeing is, over the last hundred years really, uh, government imposing regulation, taxation, controls over the economy, over economic activities, individuals, and, and individual freedom is dramatically shrinking in the West. And what the, what the left, which is primarily responsible for the shrinkage, the right typically complies with the left, but it's the left that is pushing this economic agenda. What the left argues falsely, I mean obviously falsely, is that capitalism has failed, right? Every economic crisis, they blame on capitalism. Every problem that exists in society, free markets are at fault. But if you really look at the world, if you study the history, if you actually examine what is going on out there, that is obviously false. Capitalism has been the greatest success for a political economic system in human history. It has allowed people to rise out of poverty, billions of people at this point, to rise out of poverty, achieve middle class, achieve success in life, have the opportunity to really achieve happiness and prosperity, and, and, and it's only, it, it, it's capitalism. Everywhere it's tried, it succeeds. Any era in history it tries, it succeeds. In terms of standard of living, in terms of wealth, in terms of human prosperity, no system has ever come even remotely close to the success of capitalism. And this is the real dilemma we face. Then on the one hand, it's been this unbelievably successful political, social, economic system. And on the other hand, we're turning our backs to it. We're moving away from it. And one of the reasons, but I think a superficial reason for this, is that the left dominates the historical narrative, the historical story. They tell lies about capitalism. But that can't be all of it because the reality the reality of it, it, it should be so obvious to people in terms of how big of a success story capitalism has really been. The problem is that capitalism offends people in a deep way. It offends their moral sensibilities. It offends their moral beliefs. Capitalism fundamentally is about self-interest. It's about people, individuals pursuing their self-interest as producers, as consumers, as employees, as employers. The system is a system devoted to the pursuit of self-interest. This is an identification Adam Smith made. He didn't like it because he was conventional morality. He said, Everybody pursues their self-interest, that's a bad thing, but in general, because everybody's doing it, society's better off, and that's the justification of capitalism. Nobody buys that. People's view of self-interest is negative. So if you're doing something self-interest, somebody else is doing self-interest, and we're taught by every religious leader, by every secular philosopher, that self-interest is a negative, that self-interest is somehow fundamentally bad, then what we're doing in the marketplace is a bad thing, and nobody cares about adding up all these bad things somehow creates a good. So what we see is the regulation is always, it's never to say let's regulate everything, it's always to regulate this particular behavior, that particular behavior, because it's too self-interested. Because there's somebody suffering over there and you owe them a responsibility. So the deep cause of people's rejection of capitalism is the morality that they've accepted, which is altruism. It's a morality that says the well-being of others is your primary moral concern. Your primary moral responsibility is the well-being of other people. Your primary moral responsibility is sacrifice to others. Their need is a moral demand on you. All the left, all government does is help you fulfill that moral need, that moral demand, that moral obligation. So it's completely acceptable to people to penalize rich people for the sake of poor people because rich people should be helping poor people anyway, right? They don't deserve their wealth. They should be handing it all over. Why? Because their moral obligation, according to altruism, is to help those poor people. We're just helping them along. It's the morality of altruism is anti-capitalism, but it is the morality that dominates our culture. And the, and the morality, the idea of self-interest is completely and thoroughly demonized, so that our perception of self-interest is they're crooks. So when businessmen are pursuing their self-interest in producing, or even consumers pursuing their self-interest in consuming, we view that as somehow negative, as somehow bad, as somehow distasteful, and we want to regulate it, control it, and take it out of existence. So we have a real misunderstanding 
in the world today, misunderstanding that is promoted by those who believe in altruism about what self-interest really is. What human flourishing, what human success, what human prosperity really requires in terms of self-interested action. Exploiting others is not in my self-interest. Exploiting others is a way of, I reject my own self-interest. Because if I don't have a right to live my life free, live a rational life, live my life to the fullest, if I have that right, then everybody has that right. And I have no right to exploit somebody else, to enslave somebody else, to use somebody else. But it also turns out that psychologically and morally, exploiting other people doesn't benefit me. So when one understands that self-interest is really about being rational, being productive, having integrity, having, living an independent life, dependent on your mind, not you know, living off of other people, that, that, that having pride in your own achievements is important. That's what we talk about when we talk about self-interest. It's about flourishing. It's about living the best life that you can be. It's about being the best human being you can be, taking your passions and your skills and, and doing the most with them. Now that to me is an inspiring vision of, of self-interest, a positive image of self-interest. And, and you know why, if you, if you have this one life on this earth, why is the purpose of this life to serve other people? Why shouldn't you make the most of your own life on this earth? So yes, the altruist would like you to believe that there are only two alternatives in life. Serve others, be their slave in a sense, moral slave, right? Or be a scoundrel, be a crook, be a thief, be a bad guy. I'm saying no, that's a false dichotomy, it's a false alternative. The real, the real self-interest, the rational long-term self-interest is again is about flourishing, it's about happiness, it's about pursuing your own happiness. It's about figuring out rationally, because reason is our tool, reason is our guide for survival by figuring out rationally, using reason, what are the things we should pursue, what values we should attain in order to make our lives the best life that it can be. There's no guarantee of success, we might fail, but reason demands that we learn from our failure and that we, we change course. It's self-correcting. Uh, but it's about living the best life for me, and that rejects the idea of me sacrificing to you or for me to expect you to sacrifice for me or demand that you sacrifice for me. It means living an independent life, a rational life. So the challenge is that for 2,000 years, altruism has dominated the debate, has dominated the discussion, has dominated our educational institutions. For 2,000 years, they have held them all high ground and nobody, and I mean nobody, has challenged it. No philosopher, no significant thinker has challenged the fundamental idea that morality means your sacrifice to other people, that your moral responsibility is to others, that their weakness, their need, their poverty is a claim against you. Nobody has challenged this. The last challenge to this idea was Aristotle, right? That's 2,000 plus years ago. So it's gonna take a lot to change this. This is not gonna be changed easily. It's in the Western culture's, in a sense, DNA, th this idea of altruism. We're, we're taught it from when we're this big. It's reinforced in our primary schools, in our high schools, in our universities, in our churches, by our philosophers. Everybody talks it, presidents, all the way down to kindergarten teachers. So the only way to combat that is through education. The only way to combat that is to change the debate, is to change the terms of the debate, to start talking in moral language, to try to capture this moral high ground. And I strongly believe that if you're going to make radical changes like that, it, it, it's not about politics. You know, politics is, uh, politics deals with the superficial, it deals with the end game. You gotta deal with politics, but you're not gonna make dramatic changes in politics. It's all about education. And if you're gonna educate, it's much easier in the long term to educate young people than it is to educate older people. After a certain age, most people never change their mind. You know, what that age is, is debatable. I arbitrarily have decided it's 30. Uh, so talking to people above the age of 30, you know, on occasion you can convince them, but mostly it's a waste of time. But talking to 16 year olds, 
talking to 18 year olds, talking to 20 year olds, that's when you can have a profound impact and help shape the way they think about the world. I think our resources need to be devoted to educating young people about capitalism, but more importantly, about the morality of self-interest. We need to offer them a vision of what life could be, a vision of what their life could be if they adopted the right morality, rather than being stuck in this trap of guilt, of wanting to live one life and being, and being pushed in another direction by this, you know, I would say barbaric moral code that exists, this moral code of altruism. So education, 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 and it's young people, young people, young people. That is the focus and that's how we're going to change the world. That is the key. The key is to convince them that their lives will be better, that it's in their self-interest to adopt these ideas. And then as a consequence, that what they need is the freedom to be able to live the life that these ideas demand, the life that they choose to live. So economic freedom is a consequence of the moral code, right? So you want to live the best life you can live. You want to live a flourishing life. You want to be happy. Therefore, you want political freedom. It doesn't start with political freedom. It ends with political freedom. Now I think it's still very early qua advocates for objectivism, advocates for Ayn Rand's ideas. There's so much more educational work. The fact is the culture rejects our views in mass, in large quantities. We live in democracies where people vote. 90 plus percent of the people are going to reject our ideas. We still need to do a lot more education. Uh, for, for, for an objectivist position to be in politics, in my view, is still decades away. You know, there's a, there's a lot of education. Now, that doesn't mean some people shouldn't go into politics. They, they can slow the deterioration down. They can stop the status from continuing to gain control. They can buy us time, because we need time, to educate. But don't expect the world to do a massive change bef politically before the culture has dramatically changed. It's culture first, politics second.